So there in John chapter number 14. And the subject that I'm going to be preaching tonight is the comforter. The comforter. So just to give you a little bit of context with what's going on in the story, um, this is actually right after Jesus had his last supper with his disciples. And after, the, after his last supper, he washed the disciples' feet and told them that one of you is going to betray me. And then he began to explain, expound unto them the fact that he was going to be killed and that he was going to leave them. So chapter number 14, 15, and 16 are Jesus giving sort of his final teachings to his 12 disciples as well as a comforting message. So the message tonight, I want you to understand, I want to um, explain to you who the comforter is um, and why Jesus gave us the comforter. Um, so first of all, let's, let's just think about what is a comforter. Well, a comforter, you know, it's not a blanket. A comforter, a comforter is somebody who, who comforts you. It's as simple as that. So I, I wanted to look in the Old Testament to see if there's kind of the law of first mention with the comforter. And, su- and surprisingly, there's not very many instances, or not that I even, even come to mind, that um, the comforter is used as a positive thing, where, where, look, you have a comforter, you know, this guy's going to help you and everything. Um, turn with me to so- Psalm chapter number 69. So you can just see, see what I'm talking about. Psalm chapter number 69 is a prophetic psalm regarding when Jesus was crucified. So Psalm 69 actually gives us the thoughts of Jesus while he was being crucified. Um, so, so we can understand sort of where Jesus was coming from when he was hanging on that cross and, and he was bearing the reproach and he was tortured and sad and at his lowest point. Um, if you look in Psalm um, chapter number 69, in verse number 20, the Bible reads, Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. So here, we, this, this is a passage where Jesus is ex- explaining to us, one of the worst parts about being on the cross is that he was all alone. And Jesus doesn't want, doesn't want us going through life all alone. He can understand what it's like Like when he's the only one who's bearing the reproach and when he's the only one fighting the battle and he looks for someone to pity and he finds none. So, you know, the Christian life can be lonely sometimes and and just life in general can be lonely sometimes. Actually, I read a poll uh, like a couple weeks ago and it said that over 20% of millennials say that they have no friends. I mean, just zero. Like, I mean, that's, that's tens of millions of people will just admit to, to some poll, I don't know if it was online or, or a phone call, and they just say, I have zero friends. And, and I think everyone will go through seasons in life where it feels like you're on your own. You know, you maybe you have friends, but they're gone. Um, so the point of this sermon is to, is to show us how Jesus solved this problem for us. And also I have written down, um, la- I'll read for you from Lamentations, because this isn't the only time the, the word comforter is used. Lamentations, when Jeremiah is um, weeping over the destruction of Jerusalem, he says, for these things I weep, Mine eye, mine eye run it down with water, because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. So here we see again, when you don't have a comforter, when you have nobody with you, it's, it's, a, sad, it's a sad day. It's a sad time. And Jesus doesn't want that for us. He doesn't want us to have to go through that. So after this sermon, hopefully you can understand that, that, that you're not left in that state. You will never be left in the state where you're totally and completely all alone. So let's jump back to John number, chapter number 14 with our main text. And I'm going to explain, um, tonight I'm going to explain a, a few things that the comforter does as well as who he is. Um, so point number one is about what the comforter will do for you is he will dwell with you. The comforter will dwell with you. So look, look down in um, John chapter number 14, verse number 16. Verse number 16. He says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So, Jesus is saying this because the, the disciples were very distraught with the fact that Jesus was telling them that he's going to leave. I mean, he, he, he says, look, you're you have me now, but I'm going to leave. And they're, they're, just, they're, they're just in a panic. I mean, they're almost 
well, I don't know about panic, but they're just emotionally very distraught at the thought of Jesus leaving them. Why? Because, because they leaned on Jesus. They needed Jesus, and he was helping them. And Jesus is telling them, look, don't worry. I'm going to send you another comforter to do the job that I was doing for you when I was here. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send you another comforter. So the, the first point is that he will dwell with us. Now, that's, that's comforting in and of itself. Just knowing that you have someone, someone with you, somebody standing with you, that's a comforting thought. But what makes this more comforting is who the comforter is, when you actually realize who it is. Um, if you look in verse number 17, he says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. So the Bible says that the comforter is the spirit of truth. Um, let's jump over to, ver to, to John chapter number 21. I want to show you where Jesus gives them the comforter, where he gives them the comforter. So just a, a few chapters to the right, John chapter number 21. I'm sorry, John chapter number 20, verse number 21. This is where Jesus makes good on his promise, and he gives them the comforter. He says, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whose, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. So what I want to show you here is the Bible is telling us that the comforter is, let's see, is it an angel? Is it, no. Is it a friend? No. Is it a memory that he's giving them? Oh, you'll remember me when you're gone. It'll comfort you. No. The Bible says that the comforter is the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. A comforting thought about the comforter is that the comforter is God Almighty. Amen. God Almighty is going to dwell within you. God Almighty already dwells within you. You notice where he said he breathed on he breathed on them. What is, that, what, what is another time where Jesus breathed on another human being? What does that make you think of? Well, that makes, you think of, well, it makes me think of when, when God breathed into Adam's nostrils and man became a living soul. He, he is giving you the omnipotent, almighty, life-giving God to live with you. Um, I'll read even from Genesis chapter 1. You can go there if you want. Um, just to, to, to remind you who this is. Who it is that Jesus is sending for you. He's not sending the archangel to live with you. He's not sending just, just a buddy to live with you. He's sending God to live with you. It says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Bible says that the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters during creation, to create the world. You know, you, rem you remember uh, when the, the children of Israel were going through the Promised Land and when they were led out of Egypt, he says he led them by a mighty hand and, an, and a stretched out arm. That mighty hand of God is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is who Jesus sent to dwell with you. So, why is it comforting that we have the comfort? Well, number one, he's going to dwell with us. But more importantly, it's God that's going to dwell with us. I mean, if, if the Lord is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. You know, you think about a soul winning partner. Just how, how comforting is that when you have a soul winning partner? Right. Going out by yourself versus going out with a friend. Even if the soul winning partner doesn't say a word, even if they don't even talk to you between the door, just knowing that they're standing there with you, hey, that's comforting. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, let it not be said that you're ever alone because the Bible says that, that God is going to dwell with you. And how much better is it that you have God? God the Creator, God Almighty, right. Omnipotent, All-Knowing, Omnipresent. This is who the Comforter is. So, so this is something that's, that's good to remember um, so, that, so that you don't get discouraged, right? So the first point is the Comforter will dwell with you, but the second point that's encouraging is that the Comforter will remain with you. The Comforter will remain with you. If you're still in John chapter 14, um, I'll read it in verse number... Let's see. 16. It says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. So here's the next amazing thing about this gift that Jesus is giving us, is that the comforter will abide with us forever. Amen. That means he will never leave us. Sorry. Excuse me. So verse 17. 
So there's a few ways that, that we can prove this. Because how, how do you know? Are you saying he's never going to leave me? You know, what if, I, what if I commit all these sins? What if I do this? What if I stop going to church? Is he still going to be with me? The answer is yes. So number one, you can just take the fact that Jesus told you it would be forever. What does forever mean? It means forever. It means it'll never end. So you have Jesus' word that it's going to be forever. Um, there's a few other reasons why it'll be forever. Um, turn, to John, turn back to John chapter number 7. I'll read from you from Ephesians chapter number 4. The Bible reads, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So, one thing the Bible tells us is that we are sealed with the Holy Ghost. You think of a seal. A seal is um, like a stamp, right, that you put on a letter. So that, so that you, when you give the letter to somebody, they can look at it and say, okay, I see the wax seal. And they know that it hasn't been opened or hasn't been broken. So it's a way that somebody can sort of keep a promise. Well, the Bible says that we are sealed with the Holy Ghost and that this is the earnest of the Spirit so that, that, that keeps us and reminds us that we're saved. Because the Bible says the Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So we are sealed. And the reason why it says we are sealed unto the day of redemption is because in Romans 8, the Bible reads, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up, Je raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. So one of the things that this Spirit is doing, that God is doing while he's dwelling in us, is he is awaiting the end of the world, the, the rapture, because that spirit is what is going to quicken our bodies. You see, I mentioned that the spirit is, um, is omnipotent, is almighty. Well, this is the spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from, dead, from, the, from death. This is who pulled Jesus out of the, the, the chains of darkness in hell. I mean, reached in there and grabbed Jesus out of there and pulled him out of there by a mighty hand. I mean, this is the spirit that's going to raise you up at the end. It's going to raise up your body at the end of the world. But you're there in John chapter number 7. And I want to show you that, that, that this gift of having the Holy Spirit with you forever, the forever part is not something that has been available to believers throughout all time. It says in John chapter number 7, verse number 38, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. The Bible tells us that Jesus spake of the Holy Spirit even before he gave it to them. And then he said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. But he said that, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Well, what does that mean? Because in the Old Testament, people had access to the power of the Holy Spirit. Obviously, Moses, when he parted the Red Sea, he needed the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. Um, you think of men like Saul, who, 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 who ruled the kingdoms and, and everything, and, and fought the Lord's battles. He needed the Holy Spirit, and the Bible says that the Holy Spirit rested upon him. But the difference is that, ne that back then, if you got out of sin, out of in sin, out of fellowship with God, out of church, the Holy Ghost might just depart from you. Because you see, in, in, for example, Saul, King Saul, the first king of Israel, he had the Holy Spirit resting upon him when he was a young man. And then he fell into sin. And the Bible reads, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit departed from him. And I'll read from you from Psalm chapter number 51. Um, this is David, after he committed that wicked sin with Bathsheba. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with, the, with thy free spirit. So even David, I mean, he, would, he was in a panic about the fact that God's spirit might depart from him. Because he knew he, he committed this awful sin, this wicked sin of adultery. I mean, with, with one of his best friends, with one of his good friend's wives, wives, you know. So he's sitting there, and what he's worried about is obviously God's ch going to chasten him and rain down on him. But one of the most important things he's worried about is, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Please, don't take this away from me. I need the Holy Spirit. I rely on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit fights my battles for me. I, I can't do it without the Holy Spirit. So, just don't take it from me. That's, that's what he's saying. He's saying, please restore me, but just whatever, you just don't take it from me. And, and you can see by his attitude that this is a great gift that God has given us, that the Holy Spirit will never leave us. 
I mean, who's, who's a greater, who's, are you a greater Christian than, than King David, right? I mean, yeah, uh, uh, most of us have not committed sins that are worthy of the death penalty. I'll give you that. But just aside from that in general, I mean, I don't think I, I, don't think I even come close to, to where David was at spiritually. And he was still shaking in his boots that he was going to lose the Holy Spirit. Well, right now, you, Christian, can rest, com can rest on Jesus, can rest comfortably knowing that, that, that the Holy Spirit will never depart from you. And the thing, the thing about this, though, is, this, this, is a, this is a two edged sword. Because, b turn, if, turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. And I'll explain why I say that. Why is, this, why is this a two edged sword? So, what is this sermon about? We're talking about the Comforter. The first point is the Comforter will dwell with you, He already dwells with you. The second point is the Comforter will remain with you, He will never leave you. But, which is an encouraging thought, but we have to also realize how, how important this is or how how this is just a two-edged sword. So, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Um, look down at verse number 18. It's a very famous passage. The Bible reads, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of, God, of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own? The Bible is telling us here, look, you have to flee fornication because of the fact that you, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And, and it, was, it has always been the temple of the Holy Ghost, even in the Old Testament. But the difference now is that the Holy Ghost is with you. So if you go out and you try to commit fornication, the Holy Ghost is right there with you. So you're subjecting him to that filth, right? So, so you, don't, don't you dare, don't, don't you dare go down this path. Because if you do, God, might, God will destroy you. Okay, it's as simple as that. I mean, it's just a matter of when. If you decide to go down the path of defiling the temple, defiling the flesh, defiling the, the, whole, the, the house of the Holy Ghost, then God will destroy you. It's just a matter of, of how much mercy he's going to extend to you. Right? Um, and you, I guess we, we have some time to explain this point, too. If, if you see, uh, look in verse number 19 where he says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? I think this is a good time to explain why um, our bodies are the temple. Why does, he ex why does he expect the Corinthians to already understand that their body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? I mean, there's not a ton of scriptures that explain to us why our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Well, one, one you could realize that, that Jesus called his own body the temple. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And he spake of his body. So we could look at that example and say, okay, this is where we get the doctrine that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. But there's actually another one, and it's, it's a verse that we, just, that we just read. And that's John chapter number 7. Um, if you're still there, I, you, you can go back there if you want. But he's, he said, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So he said, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Well, the funny thing about this verse is that it's, it's actually kind of hard to find in the Old Testament. If you look at it, you don't really see a place where there's just a clear verse in Psalms where it's saying that, that out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So what is he talking about? What, what, are, what does this mean, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, as the scripture hath said? Um, turn um, to Revelation chapter number 22. I think it's in here. And basically, the only, the only place in the Old Testament that I know of that has a scripture referring to living water is in Ezekiel. So some of you might know the story. Basically, Ezekiel was shown by an angel the temple of God. And, and it, he, he goes into great detail. He's like measuring it out. He's getting out the tape measure or whatever, the reed. And he's showing them how many cubits it is, how many, you know, you, you sit there and you're kind of reading it and you're like, okay, okay, okay. I'm not, <laughs> you're kind of getting lost. Uh, but then the part that, that sticks out in my mind is when the, the angel tells him to get in the water. Because he's looking at this temple, and out of this temple are all these rivers. And they, they go every which way. And then he says, actually, to get in the water. He's like, get in the water. So he, he starts leading through the water, and he puts his, his feet in, and he walks yeah, X amount, of 100 cubits or so, or 1,000, I don't remember what, but so much distance. And he says it was up to the, the ankles, right? And then he go, walks another 1,000 cubits or whatever, and now it's up to the knees. And then he walks another 1,000, and he says, it's up to the loins. And then he says, 
he couldn't go any further because the river was so huge that you'd have to swim and for some reason he wasn't confident that he could swim it. So he was like, I can't go any further. So then he was led back. So, and then he also explains that, that on the sides of the river are trees and the trees have fruit that you can eat and the leaves are medicine, the Bible says. So, so this is where you get a hint. Hey, maybe these waters are, are something special. Right? Maybe there's, there's something special about these waters. Well, Revelation makes this clear that there is something very special about this river and about these waters and about that temple. Um, so let's see. Um, I don't know exactly where it is back here, but let's see. I think it's... Does anyone know the scripture that I'm talking about where it says that the, the leaves are for the healing of the nations? I think it's in chapter 21. 22... Two. Yes, perfect. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Chapter 22, 2. This is, he's showing us the new, the new earth, the new heaven and the new earth. And he says, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, where the tree of life was there, the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Or, let me, let, and I, I skipped verse number one. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So the, the waters that are flowing out of the throne of God, these are the, this is the water of life, right? And then I think even at the end, um, when he, look, look in verse number 17, he says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Right? This is the water of life that you drink to save your soul. And what's the Bible telling us here? Well, the river that flows out of the throne of God is living water. It's the water of life. And this water is, the, is what Jesus offers to people to drink and be saved. Well, look back in John chapter 7. Well, I'll look back in John chapter 7. He says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So what are the rivers of living water? Well, it tells us. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. So the Spirit that you have received are those rivers of living water. And this is showing us a great picture of the fact that we are supposed to be a blessing to people and get people saved and allow people to drink from the living water that flows out from our belly. So isn't that, isn't that great? And, and the reason why he expected you to be able to look at the scriptures and deduce that is because... Is because um, because of Ezekiel. Because Ezekiel, when he was going through the rivers and you see the temple of God, you're supposed to be able to say, okay, those rivers are the Holy Spirit and that temple of God is our bodies. Isn't that cool? So, I mean, he, he, he kind of expects a lot from us. He expects us to connect a lot of dots. I'm glad that we have the New Testament, right? So, so, let's, so we have the Comforter. The Comforter is the living water, right? The Comforter will remain with us, or the Comforter will dwell with us and he will never leave us. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. Now, those are two things that any Christian, no matter how they live their life, is going to experience. They will experience the comforter with them that's, that's bearing witness that they are the children of God, and, and, and it will never leave them. So a lot of times we'll, we'll be at the door and we'll get somebody saved, and we won't talk about the comforter for one second, and, and, but they're left with this gift, right? Well, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain two ministries that the Comforter has that, that he also will do for us, besides just dwelling with us and allowing us to get people saved. Um, so turn back to, let's go with John chapter 14. So turn back to our main text, please. Check the time. Okay. John chapter 14. Let me, and these two points are, are, are huge, okay? Like, if he, if he just dwelled with us, that would be great. But these two points that I'm about to explain, we'll just focus on the one for now, but um, they're, they're a big deal, and I'll show you why. Let's, John chapter number 14, verse number 25. We, we read this with um, John, John Carter. Verse 20, 25. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost 
whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So the third point is that the, the Comforter will teach us. The Comforter will teach us. See, Jesus was a great teacher to his disciples, and he wants them to, to have this instructor present with them, so he sends the Comforter in his name. Um, flip or Jump over to chapter number 16. This is in the same sermon that he's preaching them. Um, and look in verse number 12. He says, he says, um, I have yet many things to say unto you now. Or, sorry. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. So, the reason why Jesus had to send the Comforter is because he couldn't teach them everything that he wanted to teach them at the time. You see, this is a principle in the Bible that, that we are to grow like a tree and not like a weed. So it actually takes time to understand the truths of the Bible and to grow in knowledge. So even Jesus Christ, he had this, this huge, huge database of information that he wants to explain to, the, to his disciples. But he says, you know what, I just can't explain it to you right now. Sometimes you can only explain one thing at a time. Sometimes you can only take it a little bit at a time. The Bible says that, that precept must be upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So you learn, you learn one truth at a time. So this is a good thing to remind myself if I'm preaching that I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. So you can't just preach everything at once. You have to preach one thing at a time. Um, so, and, and also this has to do with the emotional state that they were in. Um, so if you just go back to um, verse number 5 in, the, in chapter 16, he says, But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me whither goest thou. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. So another reason why he can't explain it to them all right now is because they're just so overwhelmed with the sorrow that they're, they're not focusing on what he's saying. So he wants to show them all these great things, but, but he can't. So... Um, so, so you just can't go over everything all at once. So, so how, does he, how does he solve this problem? Well, he sends the Comforter. He sends the Holy Spirit so that he can teach you in his absence. And just as Jesus taught his disciples line by line, precept upon precept, he didn't go too fast, he didn't skip over stuff, he made sure they got the basics, this is how the Holy Spirit will teach you. Um, flip to 1 John chapter number 2. Chapter number two. And one thing I'm going to keep reminding us, other than the fact that the Holy Spirit is always with us, is that the Holy Spirit is God. Right? And, and let's not forget what that means. Well, one thing it means is that he's not just in, 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 like an inanimate force, just some with no personality, like Star Wars or something, like it's just the force. No, it's actually a person. It's actually the God. God is three persons. United in love. Okay. They're three, they're, these three are one, the Bible says, right? So part of, part of God's attribute is that he is omniscient. He knows everything. So the Holy Spirit, your teacher, knows everything. So look at 1 John chapter number 2, down at um, verse number 20. Yeah, verse number 20. 1 John is an interesting book. Sorry, I... I I told you to look, but I'm going to explain. First John is an interesting book because it's, kind of, it's an instruction manual on how to be in fellowship with God, and it's written by Jesus' best friend. So it's kind of cool. Um, but one thing he talks a lot about is, is walking in the light, dwelling in love, but then he, he contrasts children of God with children of the devil, brothers with false brothers. So you see a lot of bold statements in chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4. That's because he's talking about spiritual truths. So it, it's important not to forget the first part, the first chapter of 1 John, where he says, hey, let's not forget we're all sinners. Because he says, um, he says um, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, right? And the truth is not in us. But let's see one of these very bold statements that John makes. So verse number 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, they went out, that they might be made manifest, that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. 
I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. So he's telling us, Christian, you know all things. You know everything. You know all things. Why is he saying that? Because the Holy Spirit is your teacher and the Holy Spirit dwells within you. You see, what, I was talking with Brother Stephen once um, about you know, going to heaven. And one of the things he said, he's like, do you, do you think we get a download? You know, just like, we just download all the information. But this was a couple years ago. So I, I really wasn't familiar with this, with this verse. And the thing is, we already have a download. We already know all things. I mean, the file is sitting on your, on your desktop. All things dot zip. It's, everything's in there, you know. It's on a shared drive. You know, you just click in, browse a little bit. The, the way to open it is, is with this, by the way. So, so you know all things. I mean, this is a big deal. So you, don't, so you say, oh, well, you know, I don't know, I don't know how to make this decision. I don't, know, I don't know what to do. I don't know if this is right. I don't know what's wrong. I don't, I don't know what's right and what's wrong. No, you do know because the Holy Spirit knows. And the Holy Spirit will teach you all things because the Holy Spirit knows all things. That's what that word um, unction, it's, it's kind of an old word. It just means anointing. So, and the Holy Spirit is referred to as an anointing a lot of times. And um, if you don't believe me, um, jump down to verse number 26, where he says, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. You know, like all those people on the internet, all those people on the TV, all those people on the radio, these people that seduce you. So he doesn't want you to fall for them. He says, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So the Bible says that because we have this anointing, and we have this great teacher, which is God himself, we don't need that any man teach us. Meaning that we can learn any doctrine, any principle, anything worth knowing from just the Holy Spirit and the Bible. So, so don't ever let, let a preacher get up and try to explain to you some hidden meaning that you would not be able to, to get to on your own. You know, like if he's going back to the Greek, or if he's telling you that he had some spiritual revelation, or if he's telling you he heard from God, he heard the words of God, and he's now giving you a new revelation, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, okay? You don't need that any man teach you. You have the Holy Spirit. Now, now preachers and teachers help you to advance faster than you would on your own. Because if we are on a desert island, and you just had the Bible, it would take you a while to, to connect all the dots. But you would. If, if you had time and you had the energy, you would do it. Um, so it, it's just something to keep in mind and to always fall back on. Don't, you can never underemphasize under the, the amount that the Holy Spirit can teach you. I mean, He can show you all things, and He can, he can, he can let you know if you're, if you're going down the wrong path. You know, He might just pop a verse in your head. Um, but He'll teach you all things. Um, now, I, I also want to go over how he's going to teach you all things. And that, that's the fact that the Bible says that he will not speak of himself. He will actually call to remembrance the words that Jesus had, had spoken to you. Um, let me see if I wrote it down in my notes. I might. Yeah. In John chapter number 16, which, where we just were, um, he says, I have, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will not speak of himself, and that he will call to remembrance the words that Jesus has spoken. So if you're ever, if you're ever, you know, given the gospel to someone, for example, and just the perfect verse pops in your mind that you read from the Bible, that's the Holy Spirit teaching you all things. Because he's not just going to start talking to you in your hey, like, you know, whatever. Like, say this, compliment her hair, you know. Like, he, he's going to call to remembrance the things that he's spoken unto you. Maybe he, maybe he might say, like, love thy neighbor or something if he wants you to compliment her hair. So, but, um, so this, this is the, the mechanism by which he teaches us. So, we have the comforter. David didn't have the comforter. Saul didn't have the comforter. And by, by the comforter, I mean the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The comforter that's just assigned by Jesus Christ himself to take care of you, to look out for you, to teach you. So we have the comforter. And remember, he dwells in us, he remains with us, and he teaches us. Now, one more thing that I'm going to go over is that 
it's kind of a main, one of the main things he does for us is he will pray with you. He will pray with you. Um, turn to Romans, chapter number 8. Romans, chapter number 8. So I don't, I don't think I, I, I upsold you when I was telling you that these things are amazing. That the, the things that the Holy Spirit will do for you, they're, they're, they're valuable. They're very valuable. Amen. So Romans chapter number 8, verse number 26. Or let's start in verse number 25. 24. It says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is not seen, or hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So he's saying the hope of our salvation, it's hope because we can't see it. The things that you can't see, that's what makes it hope. If you could see it, it wouldn't be hope anymore. It wouldn't be faith, right? Um, verse number 26, he says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray, pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So, the Bible says that the Spirit helps us pray. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish it out. In verse 27, he says, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So, what is this saying? This is kind of a lot of words. But what he's saying is that the Spirit helps you pray. And how is he helping you? Because he knows what to pray for. Because the Bible says, we know not how to pray as we ought. So, so, you know, anything that you ask the Father, if it's according to God's will, then he'll make it happen. Guaranteed, the Father loves you, Jesus loves you. If you just ask for the, the thing that, that, that he says is good, he'll give it, he'll give it to you. You know, if, if, if a son asks his father for bread or for food, you know, what kind of father is going to give him a stone or a serpent? So if you, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall the Father, you know, give good gifts to them that ask Him? So, so anything you ask from God, if it's according to the will of God, God will give it to you. Well, that's kind of a problem because we don't know what the will of God is. I don't, I don't, I don't know what the will of God is. That's why you have to pray, if it be according to your will, please do this. If it be according to your will, do that. So the Spirit is who helps us bridge that gap. So you're, you probably already knew that, that Jesus is your mediator between God and man, right? Um, he, between the Father and you. He's, he's telling the Father, look, I died for him. Look, he has my righteousness and clothed, clothed on him. Um, look, like he, he's justified. Listen to what he has to say. Well, the Spirit also makes intercession for you. So you have, you have two, it's like, it's the perfect scenario because you have two members of the Godhead who really are helping you entreat the Father and then at the same time, the Father also loves you. So he's just, he just wants, he's ready to, to give you what you want. Well, what does the Spirit do? So, the Spirit, it says, the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So, the, the Holy Spirit will not speak to you with an audible voice. Um, he will speak to you through the Word of God. He will, however, something invisible is happening that you can't see. And that is the fact that every single time you pray, the Holy Spirit is helping you pray. And what he's kind of doing is he's almost filtering what you want and, and rewording it or repackaging it in a way that's in accordance to the will of God so that he can deliver it to the, will, to, to the Father for you. So you know, so sometimes, sometimes you, might, you might just really have a burden for something and then you, you get down to pray and it's just like no words come out. You just don't even know, you don't even know what to say because you're like, I don't, I don't know how to even express myself. Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit knows what you need because he dwells within you he sees through your eyes. He knows you. He loves you. And he is going to, he is going to pray to the Father for you. He's going to say, okay, okay, I know what you mean. Tell the Father exactly what you need. And then you know what the Father is going to do? He's going to give it to you. So, so that's an amazing thing. So, so next, time, next time you pray, you know, remember, every time you pray, the Holy Spirit is helping me pray. I'm going to get what I need if it's according to the will of God. You know, if you need, let's say, let's say you need a car. You know, oh, I need this car. Well, if you need a car and you pray for a car, God's going to make a car just poof in your driveway if you actually need it. But maybe what you actually need is just a ride. So the Holy Spirit will, will maybe reword that prayer for you 
and say, look, get him a ride. You know, get him a ride to church. And then, boom, you get a ride to church. Uh, this, you can tell this is a personal example, right? <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> popped into my head. So, um, so we're talking about the comforter. The comforter is a gift. You'll see in, in the book of Acts, Paul is constantly referring to the Holy Spirit as a gift. You know, have you received the Holy Ghost? And he's saying, have you been saved? Because being saved in the New Testament is synonymous with receiving the Holy Ghost. Um, so what does the comforter do? Well, the comforter will dwell with you. He'll be in your corner. He'll fight. He'll, he'll just comfort you. I mean, it, it, that alone is, is a big deal. You know, if, if, you're, if you're at your lowest point, it's a big deal when there's just one person who's, who's there with you yeah, and yeah. says, look, I'm with you. You know, you hear like Pastor Burzins and Pastor Fritz when they were going through the stuff that they were going through. One of the things that they kept bringing up was how they appreciated people standing with them. So you have God standing with you all the time. So the second thing is he'll never leave you. Even if you commit a sin, even if you find yourself in a wicked sin, the Holy Spirit will never leave you. So take that with, with some sobriety, knowing that, that, that there's a higher standard now. Because unto whom much is given, of him shall much be required. So number three, the Holy Spirit will teach you. Ye know all things. You know that which is spiritual. It's in you. You know, we talk about the rivers of living water. Well, you have the rivers of knowledge, too. The Holy Spirit knows everything. So you have access to that well of knowledge. It's inside you. You just need the Word of God to, to help you find it. Um, well... Yeah. The Holy Spirit will help you find it in the Word of God. Because um, in Him dwelleth all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are worth having are found in the Bible. Anything worth knowing is in the Bible. If, if, it's not, if it's worth knowing, it's from the Bible or it's plagiarized from the Bible. If it's not in the Bible, it's not even worth knowing. Okay, so, so let's see. And then the, the third thing is He'll pray for you. Right? Or the last thing is He'll pray for you. So you can have confidence that that he's going to be with you and that your prayers are going to be answered. So I'll, we'll just finish on one, on this last verse. Um, jump over to Hebrews chapter number 13. And this is just a verse to leave you with. Hebrews chapter number 13. Get there myself. Hebrews chapter number 13, verse number 5. It says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave, ye, leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. The Bible says you can be content with what you have right now, because dwelling within you is a gift that, that money can't buy, that nobody else can give you except God himself. And that is the comfort of the Holy Spirit living with you. So, let, don't ever think, uh, I just need this. I just need to turn the corner. You know, we, we just need to get this all settled and then, then my life's going to be perfect. Look, you already have, you have unspeakable riches right now. You have an omnipotent God living with you. You have an omniscient God that knows everything living with you and teaching you. And you have him also helping you pray to God so that you can get anything that you want. Okay, so, so let, let, let your conversation be without covetousness. Let's just help that to just kill that covetousness, atti covetous attitude. Just remember, you know what? The comforter is always with me. Always. Nobody can take that from you. And that, that's kind of the next verse. It says that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. What can man do unto you? Well, they can take your stuff. They can maybe take your, your loved ones or your friends, um, and they can take your life. Look, they can't touch God. They can't touch the Holy Spirit that lives within you. No, you say, oh, well, I don't have any friends anymore because I, I, was, I was trying to live the Christian life and all my friends separated from me. doesn't matter. You have the Holy Spirit living inside you. He's dwelling with you. He's your friend. Um, Jesus said in that same sermon that we were going over, he said, I, know, I no longer call you servants, but rather friends. I don't know if I quoted that right, but he said, look, you're my friend. And you know, the Holy Spirit's your friend too. It's not just Jesus who's your friend. God the Father is your friend. The Holy Spirit's your friend. Jesus is your friend, right? And he says that we... That we may be, um, that we may boldly say, "The Lord is my helper." You know, I'll ask you: Were the were the verses that we just looked at true? Were the, are the words of Jesus true? Did Jesus give you the Comforter? Did He give you the Comfort? Did He give you the Holy Spirit of God? 
Did God Almighty, does he live with you? And will he never leave you? I mean, if that's true, then, then you can be bold. You don't have to, to worry about if what you're doing is right. If you know on the inside that it's right, and the Holy Spirit's in agreement, then you're right. And you can be bold about it. And you, if you know what you're doing is right, then, then no one can stop you. Because um, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. If you're doing the right thing for the right reasons, out of love for God or love for your fellow man, nobody can stop you. You know, they put a gun to your head. I mean, God can just make them drop dead. You know, th they can't do anything. I mean, the worst they can do is, is kill you, right? I mean, probably the worst thing you can do is kill your family, honestly. But God can stop that from happening because you have the Holy Spirit. I mean, all you, all you have to do is ask God. Hey, God, please, please help me out. Please save me. Please, please save my family. Please, please make them drop dead right now. And if God wants to, boom, they'll just drop dead. So... And obviously, it, it's not a physical battle. Usually, the, the challenges that you're going to be going through is just embarrassment or financial troubles. Those are, those are the two big ones. Financial troubles or embarrassment. I mean, how, you know, how, how much greater is the Spirit of God living in you? So, so that we may... So we'll, we'll just read it one more time. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my hel helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So... As we go out today and you live your Christian life, you know, we, like even if, the, even if this is the last time I'm going to talk to all of you, you know, you still have the comforter. We might be separated and never, I'm not going anywhere, but we might be separated and never see each other again or whatever, but the, the Spirit of God will always be with you. So, so just hold on to that and never forget that. God is always with you, so, so we can rely on that. So let's pray. Um, dear Heavenly Father, thank you um, for allowing me to preach this message. Um, I pray that um, I pray that I did a good job, and that that it that it will actually comfort people and and, and be effective and sink down in their ears, and that people would remember these truths. Um, we just pray that you bless us as we go, and um, we love you, God, and we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.